let's move on to the subject matter today, which is the second. Okay, and uh, we have to put it into proper context. Okay, uh, we're we're talking about space time here. We're talking about general relativity. We're talking about mathematical physics, and of course, uh, time is a very important parameter in mathematical physics. And in the case of general relativity, you have space time, which is like the foundation of general relativity. At least it's the uh, bread and butter, the uh, you know the the foundations. Okay, and so you have space and time, and time is half of that. I would say it's even more than that. Even though you have three, as they say, three dimensions of space and one of time, I think that one of time is a lot more important than the three of space for mathematical physics. Time is the one that they play with. You know, that's the one they put in equations and move around and, and stretch and divide and do all these little things. And we've been doing that at least since the days of the Greek. Okay. So uh, time is the most important parameter as far as I'm concerned. You know, that's the way I see space, time, and mathematical physics in general. Time is the key aspect, the key parameter. Okay, so we talked about time the other day. Okay, and uh, what was my conclusion? Uh, I ended up approximately in the uh, 19th century. There was really not much in the 19th century. I ended up in the 18th century, actually. But uh, the point is that, you know, until the 18th, 19th century, we had no definition of time. No one could tell you what time is, what it meant, what the word meant. Okay, they could not define the word. And it turns out, as we'll find out today, that even to today, we don't have a definition. We have no idea what time is. Not we, but the mathematicians, meaning that everyone who follows them, which is 99% plus of humanity, also has no idea what time is. Okay, so we have the mathematicians, we have the blind or the one-eyed leading the blind, you know. We have these guys who don't know what time is and everybody else who thinks that they do. <laughs> that's, that's the situation. Okay, so let's do a little brief recap of what I covered the other day so that we put it in the right context. And again, it's got to do with space-time, okay? And uh, this is essentially what I talked about the other day. Uh, Plato, Greek guy, they call him philosophers. I don't think they were philosophers at all, okay? Uh, he said that uh, time is not the same thing as eternity. In fact, they're exact opposites. And you say, well, what, what do you mean, well, Plato? What are you talking about? And yeah, uh, eternity, he says, is the now. Whatever small interval you can make that into, that's eternity. Time, on the other hand, is succession of events. And so time is like involved with motion, whereas eternity is uh, involved with existence. Okay, so he separated time from eternity. <clears throat> and, um, and yeah, okay, uh, that was his notion. Uh, Aristotle comes later and he says, uh, was a student of his, right? And he had a different idea. He said, look, uh, time is really not motion, but quantity of motion. Uh, they translate it as number of motion, but to me, number of motion makes no sense. I think he was talking about quantity of motion. And uh, one of the issues there is that, you know, you, you, you have to have motion of some kind in order to have time. Uh, you would think that that's the case. And one of the problems I found also with Plato's uh, notion there that eternity is... Um, is opposite of time is that eternity is defined as eternal time <laughs> and so you need to define time before you can talk about eternity so to say that eternity is the opposite of time uh, that's like saying black is different than white but you don't define either one okay so yeah we need to define what time is before you can talk about eternity then you can say that they're opposites well anyways aristotle said that um, time is quantity of motion okay and essentially all the other people that came afterward just repeated what plato and aristotle uh, came up with uh, you have these three uh, religious folk, uh, St. Augustine, Anselm, and Thomas, Aquinas, right? And they essentially said the same thing. And the, their idea was that God was outside of time. People would ask, you know, uh, how's, uh, uh, how is it that God created time? Like, what happened before then? And so they had to find an answer to that question. They said, look, God is outside of time. You know, God created time itself. God is the God of time, okay? And... Um, but then, you know, if you ask Augustine, you know, what is time? He said, if I have to explain to someone, you know, I have no idea what it is. You know, he says he knows what it is, but he doesn't, he can't explain what it is. He can't tell you, he can't define the word. And Anselm, you know, he, he comes up with the block universe, okay? Again, he says God is outside of time. He sees the past and the present and the future all in one block. Uh, so the block universe that general relativity gives credit to itself for having come up with, no, that, that comes all the way. The idea already was... Um, you know, on the books since the days of Anselm. And uh, Thomas just provided corollaries to both Augustine and Anselm, uh, and there's a couple of them. God lives in the now that stands still, <laughs> which is more or less what uh, Plato said. And God doesn't have to dig into his memory. In other words, um, 
God doesn't have to memorize because he doesn't have to look in his file cabinet to find out what happened in the past. It, he sees it all there in front of him, uh, past, present, and future, all if it were a block. So he doesn't have to look into his memory. That was his notion. But again, you can see these people were just trying to justify that God was outside of time because if God was within time, first, he wouldn't be so powerful. And second, if he created time, it would explain why you know there was not an infinite amount of time before uh, God uh, created the universe. It's just that God created time. Okay, so that was the notion there. Newton, well, he, he screwed up completely. He writes in his scolium, his famous Principia book, uh, that he's not going to define time because everybody knows what it is. Well, great. He didn't define time, space, or motion because he said everybody already knows what it is, so why am I going to take the trouble? But he had this notion of absolute time that, you know, when you die, time continues. Like there's this time machine in, in the universe that uh, rolls time out, and it doesn't matter what you do, uh, time continues to roll independent of you. Okay, so that was the notion he had. That was later on going to be challenged by relativists. Okay, uh, they talked about relativistic time, and, and then you have these two guys in the 18th century, Hume and Kant. Okay, and uh, again, you look at them, you find that after so many centuries, they had not uh, zeroed in on the definition of time. Hume says time is a manner in which some real objects exist. In other words, successively, like. One object exists right after another, which doesn't tell us much. Okay, and Kant said uh, he, he really addressed a lot of Hume's issues, and he asked the same question that uh, Aristotle began his uh, Physics uh, Book Four with, and that is: Is time an entity? Is it a thing? And does it exist? So he has the same question. He starts out in the same place. Where does he end up? Well, he says time is successive. You know, spaces coexist. So he says that uh, uh, whereas objects can be at the same place. Okay? I'm sorry, in two different places at the same time, time, on the other hand, cannot be at the same time. Time is one right after another. So he was saying that's how time differs from space. Okay? Not sure if the uh, relativists will agree with that. But uh, he ends up with this definition. He says, time is pure form of the sensuous intuition. What the hell does that mean? I have no idea. Okay? But uh, again, it shows that these people could not define the word time. They had no clue what it is. They died without understanding the word time. And they just rolled along. And today, a lot of people who uh, call themselves philosophers, they study, you know, especially Hume and Kant, and uh, they never picked up on that, the fact that these two individuals never were able to define the word time. So there's nothing to study about Kant and uh, Hume because they cannot define time. So what are you going to study them for? Study someone who can define the word time, then you'll know something about it. And the same with Aristotle and Plato. I mean, what are you going to go and look at their books for if... You know, I mean, I look at them, uh, so I should slap myself. But there's nothing you can learn from them other than, uh, you know, how they reasoned to come up with a no definition or a definition which is unscientific, irrational, because they can't use that definition consistently. So, again, you know, why study them other than to know, oh, it's nice, this is what they thought about time. Okay, so what's the issue? The issue is that um, the unit of time is the second, okay? We don't know what time is, but the unit is the second, okay? And... A lot of people have this notion that the second, uh, in fact, they explain it. You'll go through the Internet and look at maybe 90, 95 percent of the articles out there, maybe even more. Uh, and they say that the notion of the minutes and seconds came all the way from the Sumerians, uh, Akkadians, uh, I don't know, the uh, Babylonians, Assyrians, you know, Egyptians. Uh, no, those people who say that haven't done a minimum of research and certainly they are not very deep thinkers. Okay, um, there was no reason, no purpose to using seconds and minutes in days of old, you know. And uh, so the question is, uh, what the uh, Sumerians came up with was the number 60, the, the system based on the number 60. You know, they were interested in, in numbers like 3, 4, 12, 24, 60, 30, you know. Those numbers were important to them, and they built this system based on 60 instead of on a decimal system or, you know, uh, tens and hundreds, okay. So their, their notion was 60s. And what did they come up with? Well, they have a couple theories of how they came up with them, and it's got nothing to do with a second or with a minute, okay. So that's, that's what I'm trying to say here, okay. And here's a... Uh, summary of that, okay, uh, here's the Sumerians, okay, and originally, you know, they more or less figured out that the Earth orbits uh, the Sun in about 360 days, okay, and uh, so, you know, the Earth orbit is equal to one degree per day, okay, they looked at their fingers, they said, hey, this is a good way of, um, you know, uh, mnemonics to, to be able to uh, count and do quick math, and they said, look, if we divide the fingers, the four fingers, 
right? We take the thumb out, and you count the uh, phalanges. Uh, well, you, you know, you have 12 of them, and so that's a multiple of three and four. And then if you multiply it by the five fingers of your other hand, well, you get 60. And so they started doing all these calculations based on this system. And that's where they came up with a 60. And then they figured out that the, you know, the circumference uh, uh, had 360 degrees. What did that have to do with? Well, maybe, I mean, this is my guess, but I think it all is related. The fact that, you know, the circle, if you take the radius of a circle and uh, you build uh, six uh, equilateral triangles, uh, you can fit them in there, uh, in, in, inside a circle. And so you have six equilateral triangles. They, each side of those triangles is the radius. And so, you know, you can see why they started playing around with a number 60 and numbers related to 60. But this has absolutely nothing to do with the second or the minute, okay? This is what they were using in those days. This, this was their clock, okay, which was a sundial, okay? <laughs> and you can see uh, that uh, it's built in uh, uh, units of hours, okay? You have all these hours there. And the hours don't go 24 hours. You know, they go like from 9 in the morning to 6 in the afternoon. So it was when the more or less when the rooster crowed <laughs> to when you punch your card out and that was when you couldn't see anymore out there in the field and there was no use in staying out there you know maybe a lion might pounce on you so you better get out of there so you know this is what they were using and it was a question of hours not a question of minutes or second not by a long shot okay now later on they uh, came up with the um, with um, the clepsidra which was a a, uh, a sand clock but done with water okay in fact the Water clock uh, preceded the um, the uh, sand clock, the hourglass, and what was it? So so they would have this drop fall from one uh, bowl to another, and uh, you know that uh, they more or less had an idea how long it took. Okay, they probably measured it against the sundial during the day. They said, okay, it takes so much water to fall, and this would be approximately eight hours, and that's what they started using at nights. For what, I don't know. I mean, if you're going to sleep at night, why do you need to know <laughs> what happens every hour, you know? So I don't know exactly why they would uh, control time at night or be interested in that, but apparently they had some use for that. But the issue is it was all hours. It all had to do with hours. The uh, minutes and uh, seconds, they started really coming into use, if not theoretically, but, you know, actual use. In the 16th century, in the second half of the 16th century, that's when they started building some of the clocks, some of the accurate clocks, and they started putting the minutes and the seconds, which, by the way, you know, people say, well, why are they called minutes? Why are they called seconds? Well, the minutes, minute, you know, small. It was a, a piece of the hour, okay? What was a second? Well, it was the second division of the hour. So the first division was the minutes, the minutes, the smalls, okay? And the second division of that was the seconds. That's why they're called seconds. Okay, so you had the second, the second division of the hour. Okay, that's why, and, and then they put the second hand, okay, in there. And uh, one of the uh, uh, fellows that built clocks in those days was this gentleman here. His name was Joseph Berge. And you can see the clocks that he made. They were very, very fine clocks. These clocks are, by the way, available today. They're in museums. And they're beautiful clocks. And uh, obviously, the people who bought these were princes. Okay, they, 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 um, uh, in fact, contracted Berge to build them. Not only Berge, there were, uh, obviously wasn't the only clockmaker in Europe, but he probably is one of the most famous ones because he really built beautiful clocks. And so they, uh, you know, the princes uh, contracted him to build clocks for them. And you can see they're very fine, uh, they're built in gold and so on. And, you know, for that, you needed uh, someone with money to pay for that. It was a, it was a work of art more than, than just a, you know, a timekeeping device. But imagine if the prince had this on his bed, his uh, night uh, <laughs> table, you know, it has this little device that measures time accurately to the second. And it was quite accurate because apparently it only fell back like one second per day for, for that time, for the 16th century. I think that was very, very good. Okay, so they were able to uh, calibrate it to, to that level. And yeah, the princess must have been very happy with, with that little device. And, of course, there are a few clocks uh, in, in general from those days because, you know, it was a very expensive device that only rich people could afford. I mean, if you were poor, you probably got a wooden one, and more than likely you didn't get one at all. Okay? People didn't care about time. I mean, the common folk out in the streets, they didn't care about the minutes and seconds. It was only for, like, you know, for maybe astronomers, people who were 
uh, the so-called uh, cutting edge of science. Those were probably the people who would be interested in seconds and minutes. And, you know, kings and princes, you know, they, they would say, hey, I'd like to have that device. I can measure, you know, uh, time very accurately. What for? I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, they would be able to do that. Okay. What happened was, you know, they, uh, that was, again, in the 16th century. Now you get to the 17th century. One of the first to uh, make an interesting clock would be Galileo. And Galileo built this uh, pendulum clock. Well, he didn't build it. I'm sorry. He, uh, he was blind, uh, which was uh, around 1637, 1638. And he dictated uh, his uh, idea to his son. And his son uh, made the picture, the drawing that you see on the left there, and it was never built because both of them, uh, Galileo and his son, died before they could ever build it. And today they built it, and it does work. So you see it there on the right. So if they would have built it, yeah, it would have worked, okay? And it would have kept time fairly accurately. You know, it was uh, perhaps the first, at least, design of the pendulum clock. The guy who is really credited with inventing the pendulum clock, again, I don't think he should be called the inventor, maybe the guy who built the first one but not the inventor, uh, was Huygens, you know, Christian Huygens, he was uh, in Holland, and he built clocks as well, and uh, also, you know, uh, four princes and other rich folk. So he built these clocks, and it's a pendulum clock, okay? And again, uh, it was to track time ever more carefully, more precisely, okay? And so, yeah, time was becoming more and more important, not for the ordinary man, because the ordinary man had no use for seconds. This was only among the rich, maybe, only for interest of some kind. Uh, it's very likely by that time they had already calculated, you know, the, um, the fact that a second was so many uh, portions of the year, okay? So they, they probably figured that out eventually, okay? They did their calculations and were able to figure out what portion of a year, first, first divided into months, then into weeks, days, you know, hours, and eventually, to, you know, minutes and eventually to seconds, and they had to have a good idea how many seconds was in a year. Okay, so they, they started tweaking those numbers. They had an idea, and the second now takes uh, a certain importance, at least in the, you can call it the scientific world, the world of researchers. Okay, okay they started timing things, in other words. Okay, uh, there was an accident that occurred in 1707, uh, a disaster at sea, and it's uh, near the Isle of um, Scilly, uh, <laughs> Scilly Island. Okay, and this uh, happened near the, again, it's a British... Um, military uh, contingent that uh, uh, essentially four of their ships uh, fell as they uh, approached um, uh, England. And the issue was that uh, these people miscalculated their position, their location in the sea. They thought they were uh, where you see the blue dot there, uh, far away from um, the uh, peninsula there that you see, okay, Penzance and, and uh, for those of you who know a little bit of uh, uh, United Kingdom geography, Penzance is that uh, peninsula that you see there, and right at the corner of that you see that little island or little sets of island, that's the Isle of Scilly. And the issue was that they thought they were at the blue dot, when in fact uh, they were really at the de at the red dot, and they crashed against the rocks, four of the ships went down, and they lost, they don't know exactly, but maybe around 2,000 sailors. Okay? And they were coming from um, Gibraltar after a war there against the French, for the succession of the Spanish crown, and those kinds of things. So what happened was Parliament, um, you know, they put out a little contest and they said, look, a little prize. They said, we're going to give three million bucks. Today's three million bucks, just to give you an idea. Anyone who can figure out longitude, because latitude they can figure out, no problem. But longitude was the, the issue. See, uh, latitude you, you can figure out uh, by using the stars and the sun and all that stuff. So you can more or less guide yourself at, it, during the day and at night. <clears throat> but when you have uh, longitude, you know, uh, east-west direction, now, now what do you do? And there were a couple problems with that. One was that, you know, this, this accident, this disaster. Another one was that um, the way they, the ships would go in those days, you know, people think, well, they just sailed out from Europe and went to America, for example, right? And straight line. And it didn't work that way. The way they did it, they would go north first, following the sun, following the stars, right? until they reached a region which they already had mapped, and then they would go straight across, okay? And part of the problem with that was that the pirates also knew that. <laughs> they knew the routes. So if you wonder why so many uh, ships, fishy Spanish ships, why they were boarded and uh, their loot was uh, taken away, etc., was because the pirates knew the routes. 
And so th this was another problem. They wanted to get away from, you know, scheduled routes so that they could go any way they wanted. And for that, they needed longitude. And so they, they put out this little contest, this prize money. And one fellow, uh, he came out and he uh, figured out a clock. He was a watchmaker, a clockmaker. And John Harrison was his name. And he came out and he says, OK, look, he came up with this little device. Okay, And um, they would take it on ships and they would know uh, more or less the... Uh, the longitude and again all this measured time to a very at very accurate uh, very precise uh, level and uh, he eventually got his prize money he had to fight for it uh, looks like Parliament didn't want to pay him and it took him some years to get his money but he got his prize money but because of that you know they uh, this was a great invention uh, regarding time because now not only could you measure time precisely on a ship you know, that's moving around and so on. But on top of that, uh, you were able to, um, uh, you know, use it to go to through different routes. You didn't have to take the route that you always took. Okay? And and because you were able to know how far away you, you were from this place or this other place, you would know if you were going to crash against, like, the craggy rocks of, uh, of, uh, of this little island there, okay, the silly island. In fact, um, if, if you never crashed against the Silly Island, you were not, <laughs> not a sailor, not a captain of a ship. Because just about, if you look up the Silly Island, uh, there's been a crash almost every year <laughs> for the last 300 years. You know, everybody's crashed against this island. Okay, um, so what's the story? The story is that, you know, the year is what was used all the way at least till the 19th century. In fact, throughout the 20th century, all the way to 1967, actually, uh, to measure the second. Okay. Actually, it was they measured the year and they divided it up in all these little pieces. 12 months, 52 weeks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and you had 31,540,000,000 uh, uh, 31, um, seconds. That's how much we have in a year. And what is a year? 30 kilometers. Okay. What is Bill Gates' uh, definition of time? A comparison of two motions. You're comparing one second. That's your second hand. Okay. The second uh, division of the hour. Right moving one tick mark from one mark to another that's we'll call that one second right so it moves one second during that time as you say right what are we doing we're comparing that distance that the uh hand went from this distance to this distance from one tick mark to the other tick mark and during that period the earth went around the sun 30 kilometers so you're comparing two motions you're comparing the motion of the second hand on your watch to 30 kilometers of the motion of the earth around the sun that's what a second is. That's what time is. Time is a comparison of two motions. No one ever figured it out. No one ever had a definition for time. I'm giving you the definition of time. Okay, comparison of two motions. That's all time is. Okay, but uh, did it stay that way? <laughs> well, the 19th century came around, and it was an uh, unfortunate century, especially second half, because uh, the mathematicians started getting more abstract, weirder, okay, crazier. They started inventing things that... Uh, kept them farther and farther away from physics itself. Okay? And they started doing a lot of abstract math and forgetting about physics, which is the opposite of abstract. They're antonym. Abstract, physics, they're opposite. So if you're doing abstractions, you're not doing physics. You're farther away from physics. Okay? And that's what we have today, abstractions. OK, so what, what was the uh, issue? Uh, here I showed the other day okay, where uh, they figured out that uh, time dilated. Okay? In other words, they say that if a train goes by a station, we have a difference in views of the observer that's, uh, you know, that's on the platform there and a passenger on the train. And if you have lightning strike the front and the back of the train at the same time, exactly at the same time, these two observers are going to see something different. Okay? One guy, the, the guy on the, on the platform, he's going to see the, both of them strike at the same time because those two rays are going to come directly at him uh, because he's equidistant from both of them. On the other hand, the passenger on the train is moving in the direction of where the front of the train is, so that ray from the front side of the train is going to reach him first before the one from the back of the train. He would conclude that those two lightning bolts did not strike at the same time. Okay, And so what's happened here is uh, now they're introducing the observer into physics. Now we're talking about opinions, what the guy saw. We're, we're having testimony. We're having witnesses. And that's a no-no in science. Science is objective, not subjective. But they introduced in this way subjectivity. Why? Because they were trying to calculate. You know, they're trying to use their equation to calculate what one person would see, what the other person would see when they have a relative motion. 
And uh, one guy credited with that was Lawrence, uh, 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 Lawrence, um, uh, a mathematician of the late uh, 19th century, and he was credited with coming up with a Lawrence uh, factor. And what is that? That's that little equation that you see at the top there. And this is how he's going to explain, again, this time dilation. And they were trying to figure this out partly because of the null, or you can say the majority of mathematicians agreed that there was a null uh, result from the uh, Michelson-Morley experiment. In other words, what Michelson and Morley apparently did in, 19, in uh, 1887 is prove to the mathematical crowd that, um, you know, that there is no ether. And so they were trying to address that issue, and they ended up with this equation. But this equation is, um, you know, the, the, the guy who's credited with that is Einstein today. He's credited with all this time dilation stuff. turns out that, you know, uh, Lawrence came uh, up with this equation before Einstein did, and even before Lawrence. We have this other fellow, and uh, his name is Voigt. He's a German fellow. And here's this paper. He wrote it in 1887, when Einstein was only, what, eight years old. You know, Einstein was in his knickers still. And, uh, and this guy wrote this paper in which he's got the main factor, which is the 1 minus v squared over c squared. v squared meaning the velocity, your velocity, the traveler or whoever, right? And c, uh, c squared being the velocity of light squared. And of course, if v squared approaches c squared, V, v squared over C squared equals 1. 1 minus 1 is 0, and you have division by 0, which is not allowed. Okay? It gives you infinity. So, uh, you know, so they concluded that, yeah, um, uh, James Maxwell was right. You can't travel faster than the speed of light, essentially, right? And um, this was the equation, I think, the main component of the Lorentz factor. And it came from this guy, Voigt. And it came when Einstein was only 8 years old. But Einstein's credited with all this stuff. Now, I don't care about all this, uh, really, because, you know, uh, this is just math. We don't do math in science. We don't do math in physics. It's the mathematicians who incorporate math into physics and into science. Math only describes science. Physics explains. And that's the difference between science and math. Math is just a language. That's all it is. It's a language of descriptions exclusively. It doesn't do anything other than describe. Science, physics, is about explaining. You have to explain what causes gravity. What causes, why does a magnet attract another? This is what you need to explain, okay? and so math helps us not at all uh, in that regard, you know, for that purpose. Okay, so I don't care much about that, who, who was the first. I'm just trying to clarify that Einstein was not the inventor of uh, dilation of any kind, you know, uh, mass dilation, time dilation, length contraction or dilation or whatever, none of that. And that already was there when Einstein was still a kid, okay? So all I'm saying, you know, we don't agree with dilation of any kind. That uh, you know that mass contracts, for example, uh, you know, or math expands, or anything like, or length contracts, or length expands. We don't believe in any of that nonsense because you have to be irrational to say that because a ruler traveled at the speed of light, it contracted, and then when it stops, it gets bigger again. No, that's got nothing to do with a ruler. It's got to do with the observer and what the observer measures, which is what uh, the Lorentz factor talks about. It has nothing to do with a ruler itself. It has to do with people with opinions, with witnesses, with what they saw, what they measured. And so you have this debate on whether the contraction is real or not out there. And again, it's got to do with this contraction, with, with this factor that they use to decide mathematically whether something contracted or not. But all that is observer-related. It has to do with measurement, with what someone measures, an observer measures. It has nothing to do with the reality of the thing itself. And that's very easily shown that it's nonsense what general relativity, really in this case special relativity, what special relativity proposes. And that is that, you know, the ruler contracts. Well, uh, so did it become shorter? And then suddenly when it arrives at your desk, it grows back again? And you might even say, yeah, that's the case. Okay, well, we'll let it go by. How about mass? Mass increase, right? They say that if you travel close to the speed of light, mass increases. Okay, you got it right? What is mass? quantity of matter. So did we put more atoms, did the thing accumulate more atoms because it travels close to the speed of light? So the ant turns into an elephant because it travels at the speed of light. It, it accumulated all these new atoms somehow. It increased the number of atoms in its body, became an elephant. And then when it comes to rest, it goes back to being an ant. You know, again, this has to do with the observer, it has nothing at all to do with reality of physics, physical reality. Okay, so the nonsense that general relativity proposes, special relativity proposes in this instance, 
could be you know thrown down to the toilet very easily. It's just poppycock. Uh, it has nothing to do with physics. Okay? It has to do with observers and measurement, which is what the mathematicians are interested in, who only describe with equations, and which none of that has anything to do with explaining, you know, how gravity works or how uh, you know magnets work or whatever. Okay, so what happened? Well, as a result of this, uh, Einstein was credited with all this stuff, and uh, he began, you know, stretching the second. Okay, so he's saying that now we can stretch and shrink uh, seconds depending on, you know, how fast you travel. You know, so this is what we have today. Nothing has changed in the last hundred years. Uh, that was, uh, what is it, 1915? He wrote his general relativity paper. Before that, 1908, the, this notion was around already, uh, what is known as relativity or special relativity. And you had people other than Einstein who already had um, come up with this stuff. Somehow they gave the credit to Einstein. Okay. And so, yeah, we have expanding seconds. Now the second stretches. Okay? You can stretch the seconds. Why? Because you travel at the speed of light or whatever. And also because of location. Okay? And so one of the things that the mathematicians do today, they say, this has been proven. We've proven it. Okay, what have you proven? Well, we've proven that, you know, if you take uh, a clock into outer space, it ticks at a different rate than it ticks here on the ground. So... Einstein predicted that, and so his theory is correct, so he's, he's given all these, um, you know, pats in the back. He's given all these kudos. And, you know, we don't need Einstein for that. Uh, we knew that uh, all along for many years that, you know, Mercury, I'm sorry, uh, Mars, uh, takes about twice as long to go around the sun than the Earth. Why? Because it's farther away from the sun. You know, you twirl a ball around your finger, the, more, the longer you make the string, the, the slower it goes. Okay, so did we need Einstein for that? Did we need to run an experiment to prove that? Okay, we already had that idea. But it turns out that Einstein is wrong anyways. I mean, his theory is complete bunk, and it's very easily debunked. And I debunk it here you know, very easily, okay? And the ideas that they have today is that if you take a clock and you take it to outer space, okay, that clock should um, run faster. And if you take it down on Earth, right at sea level, for example, it should run slower. Why? Because gravity has an effect on the clock that's close to sea level. Okay? So this clock has the pull of gravity. It goes slower. Okay? And the clock that's out there, because it's farther away from gravity, gravity doesn't have the same influence over it, it goes faster. And they say, we've proven it. We've taken clocks out there and we've proven it. Well, maybe, just maybe, they didn't take the right clock. I mean, if you're going to talk about time in relation to gravity, you've got to take a gravitational clock. Not uh, atomic clock. Atomic clocks are not gravitational clocks. They have to do with the wave, you know, the how many blips, you know, for example, cesium uh, wave has. It has nothing to do with gravity per se. Okay. And so what we do is we do it with a, a gravitational clock. Okay. And here's the most, uh, probably the best gravitational clock that you'll find. You can buy it at the ten cent store. Okay. And it's a known as an hourglass. It's the clock that works exclusively because of gravity. So that's the best uh, clock to test it with. Now you take a cesium clock, right? Uh, watch, <laughs> wristwatch. You take it out there and it's going to distort time anyways. Because again, if, um, if, if it's at sea level, it has a different rate than if it's out there in the sky or in, the, or in space. So we have no accurate clocks if we're going to talk about accuracy. All clocks dilate. <laughs> okay, so all, there's not a clock that will mark steadily the same time uh, at different uh, regions of space, okay, or, in, or uh, you know, different heights above sea level or above the center of gravity of the Earth. Uh, and so we take our little hourglass and we show that it's the opposite. It's not that uh, the clock is faster at, uh, you know, out there in space. It's quite the opposite. It runs slower. And if you take that same clock, a gravitational clock known as an hourglass, right, and you take it to, to uh, sea level, that clock will run faster because it's closer to gravity and the grains are going to come out of the uh, little glass container there going to come out faster okay so uh, our clock proves general relativity wrong because it's the it has the opposite effect of what they predict as it's known they call it a prediction well here's a prediction you know i'll say that my clock runs faster when it's at sea level than when it's out there in the middle of nowhere in fact if you take it farther out not a single grain will fall and according to the uh, lunatics of relativity they would say that time has stopped because they decide everything by measurement, and now if not a single grain falls because there is no gravity out there, they say, well, time has stopped. That's what they would conclude. That's their 
rationale. That's the way a mathematician thinks. He says, oh, it goes slower, slower, slower. And when it goes out there where there's no gravity, they say, oh, it stopped altogether. So now time is not longer, no longer flowing slowly. Now it's stopped altogether. <laughs> so that's the mathematical mind, how they think. Okay, but not only did they stretch the second, dilate it and do all these fancy things, they also chopped it into pieces. They chopped the second. They weren't, they weren't satisfied with, you know, with uh, just the second. Okay, they had to, because, see, uh, until the 20th century, at least, most of the 20th century, uh, they were just dealing with seconds. But after that, they invented the millisecond and the microsecond and the picosecond. Now we're talking about portions of a second. You know, they keep going, they're, they're <laughs> going to end up with no second at all. I mean, you know, they're going to end up with zero second. And they're going to say, well, what do we call this one? The, the uh, second that's approaching zero, almost touching zero? I don't know what they're going to call it. The second is disappearing, folks, and that's dangerous because once it disappears, we, we have no time, okay? But they invented chronons, and what is a chronon? Well, this is where you got to, you know, hold on to a seat because you might fall and break your neck, okay? The chronon is a particle of time. It's like if you take the second and turn it into a ball, and so now you have a ball of second. <laughs> the second is a ball, okay? What is this uh, chronon? Well, here you have a definition, okay? It goes something like this. It says, a chronon is a quantum of time, the smallest discrete and indivisible unit of time. Okay, so it's, we're talking about a portion of time, okay? A unit of time. So far, it looks like they're just talking about numbers, right? You would say, okay, take the number line, you chop off the five, it's just the number. Okay, so far, so good. Uh, what's the hypothesis? Time is not continuous. Well, Aristotle would have a problem with that because for... Aristotle continuous was exactly the opposite of what they define there. In other words, continuous was something that you could chop. That's what he called continuous. Otherwise, it was not continuous. You figure that out from good old Airy, okay? But that's, that's the notion he had of continuity. But anyway, it says, in a one-dimensional model, one-dimensional model, what are they talking about? One-dimensional, a little stick? No, they're talking about an itinerary. They call itineraries dimensions in the religion of mathematics, okay? So whenever they say dimension, they're talking about itineraries. They're talking about, especially one-dimensional, right? Because they're talking about an itinerary traced by whatever object. They don't care about the object. They don't care if it's three-dimensional. But they look at the itineraries. It's a one-dimensional itinerary, trajectory or path or whatever. Okay, So they're saying a one-dimensional model, meaning a one-itinerary model. Huh? A chronon is a time interval or period. Okay, Is a non-decomposable, well, well, in an n-dimensional model, it's a uh, non-decomposable. Uh, posable region in n-dimensional time, okay? What are they talking about? Well, they're saying they've got all these little chronons that form part of this dimension. I thought dimensions were used to, in, in the context of objects, so now they're saying, well, we have the length. We're going to chop the length, which is a piece of that object, I guess, right? So we're talking about a little particle, right? And that's exactly what it is. It's a quantum of time, okay? But they're saying that time itself, remember time in general relativity at least, is a physical object. It's it's that portion that, together with space, forms the container in which we live, which we inhabit. Okay, We live in this container known as space-time. What is uh, gravity? Well, it's the warpage of time. Okay, You have the Earth pushing against this depression, which is time. Okay, it, Time is being warped by the sun pushing down on the space time meaning you're warping time and that's the explanation they give you for why the earth cannot leave the solar system because somehow it comes up against this curved wall of time and so time is a physical object and they're going to go in there and they're going to take a quantum of time they're going to take a little bit of that and they're going to say that's the chronon so now we have a chronon which is a little particle of time everything is particles in in mathematics, they have no, never proposed anything outside of particles. Okay, what's a particle? Well, who knows? It's certainly not the corpuscle of old, of what is known as classical physics. Okay, classical mechanics. Okay, so we have this. Um, not only have we stretched the second, we have chopped it up, and we've converted it into a little ball called the chronon. Okay, so so we have all these notions, and the question is, you know, can you define a second? Can you define Time. No, you can't define either because they made a complete mess of it. <laughs> That's why you can't define it anymore. It's beyond rationality now. 
you know, if, if you chop the second to little pieces until you get the pico second and who knows what else continues, the terra second, you know, and that's on the one hand. And on the other, you stretch it, you say, well, but it's traveling at the speed of light, so now it's stretched, okay, and uh, or compressed or whatever, right? And then, and then uh, you have, um, uh, uh, then you have it turned into a ball because now they have the chronon, which is a particle of time, a quantum, a, a chunk of time. What is time? Time is this thing that forms space time, which is a curved wall against which the Earth lies, you know, as it rolls around, as it orbits the sun. So you have this whole mess. And so, yeah, you can't define time. You can't define the second under those uh, assumptions or those theories. You know, if those are the theories you're going to subscribe to, how are you going to define time now? How are you going to define the second? Well, yeah, they have no idea. So what they do is they define the second, you know, longer, no longer it's a piece of the orbit of the Earth, 31 uh, billion, 540, I think it was, uh, million seconds. No, it's no longer that. Now, and that would have been quite accurate, but now they have it, this, this atomic clock that measures, you know, the, the uh, second. They look at the, how many vibrations a cesium wave has, and they call that a second. So many trillion vibrations, they say that's a second. But you take that clock into outer space and you have a totally different reading. See, that doesn't happen with the Earth. The Earth is constantly going around the sun more or less at the same rate. But the cesium clock, you know, if you take it out of a certain sea level, out of a certain temperature, at a certain distance from gravity, you know, et cetera, all bets are off. Then you have a totally different reading. In fact, someone calculated, I was looking at a calculation there, that fellow says that if you take the uh, atomic clock, the cesium clock, right, and you put that same clock uh, on the moon, on the surface of the moon, it, it would uh, be different than one on Earth by 21 seconds. I think it was per hour that guy calculated or something like that. So it would be off by 21 seconds. And so, you know, it's an inaccurate clock because it depends on where it's at in the universe. And so that's not an accurate clock. I think a much more accurate clock is the Earth going around the sun, which is quite reliable, you know, at least so far until an asteroid hits us or whatever and causes our extinction, right? Okay, um, so this is what they um, they have today. This is the... Uh, we've replaced the orbit of the Earth around the Sun with this contraption. They're, they made more uh, user-friendly contraption since then. This was probably one of the first ones that looked like that. It was a big thing. Today they have it made smaller. But they have these atomic clocks. They put them on the satellites and they control GPS Okay, uh, by trilateration. Okay, okay so uh, uh, what's, what's the deal? Well, here's, here's the conclusion of all this so that see if we can recap uh, what the second is, what time is, okay? And these are my conclusions. Relativity is based on space-time. That means time is very important, very important uh, leg of general relativity, which is the, you know, the current catechism in mathematical physics, so-called, called also physics, erroneously called physics, also called science, again, erroneously called science. None of this has anything to do with science whatsoever. Uh, because science explains, and these guys, they describe with equations, which could be correct, we don't care about that, but then the explanation they give is totally irrational, and that's what we look at. We look at what's your mechanism for gravity? What's your mechanism for uh, attraction of two magnets? What is your mechanism for electricity and the workings of the atom? That's what we're interested in, and you will never get it from mathematical physics in general and relativity in particular. Okay, uh, no definition of time today. We have none today. Maybe next time. <laughs> Yeah, we have no definition of the word time. And these are some of the definitions you'll find out there. I just put three out there, but you'll find more similar to these. What a clock measures or reads. Okay, what's a clock? Well, a clock is what measures or reads time. <laughs> so we don't know what, a, what it's measuring. You know, uh, what do you mean what a clock measures? You know, measuring a horse while it runs? I mean, we don't know what a clock measures. Okay, the continued sequence of existence and events. The continued sequence, one thing right after another. Well, that could be locations, one location after another in, uh, you know, uh, something that's moving. Is, is that time? Okay, we have uh, one, uh, like you, you take uh, a movie, right? And you look at the frames of the movie, and here you have the horse in one location, another location, another location, no, another location. Well, you have the sequence of existence. Is that time? Is, if that's all that God made out there, you know, just, uh, you know, a horse at different locations, is that time? Or is that just motion? So no, uh, that definition is obviously wrong. A measure of, of non-stop, <laughs> measure of non-stop, uh, consistent change, of non-stop, consistent change. 
again, you know, if something changes, is that time? Or is that just motion? The word change is a synonym of motion, not of time. Okay? For time, you need memory. You need to memorize the locations of the two objects which you are comparing, uh, that are moving, and with, uh, whose motions you are comparing. That's what time is. And so you need memory. Without memory, you have no time. Okay? So that's very important. Anyways, the second is only 400 years old. It's not 2,500 years old, as you'll see throughout the Internet. All these people are just parroting what other people say and just put it in there. Say, oh, the 60 seconds came from the uh, Assyrians or the Sumerians or whatever. No. The 60, the 60 system came from them, not the second or the minute. That came only about 400 years ago. Okay? So that's a new invention. It's uh, still in its infancy, you could say. And it's already about to die. Uh, I guess uh, what I call it uh, when they uh, grow old very suddenly, those babies. I uh, can't remember the name of the disease. Anyways, uh, yeah, this is a baby that's already grown very old, very suddenly. Okay? Um, the second has been stretched and partitioned. So, you know, if you stretch it, do you still have a second? If you cut it into pieces, do you have a second? If you turn it into a ball, do you have a second? I mean, we've lost all track of what a second is right now. And they say, well, we measure it with the cesium wave, you know, vibrations. But you take that out into outer space, it has a different reading, so... What's a second? We have no idea. We don't have a definition for it, and we don't know what it is because, again, you know, if they say it's the so many vibrations of the cesium, well, you take it out there, it has a different reading. That means you have to specify more conditions, meaning at what latitude, at what temperature, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, it's very, very, you know, you got to be very precise on, on what you mean by the second today. You can't really define it uh, except with putting so many of these parameters in there. Okay. Once you take it a little bit farther higher, farther lower, all bets are off. Okay, uh, they morphed it into a particle. The famous chronon is now the new particle of time. And it's interesting that it forms uh, part of space-time because if a chronon is for real, if, if that quantum of time is going to form part of space-time, it forms part of the canvas. Okay, And if it forms part of the canvas because it prevents the Earth from flying out of the solar system, well, then you're talking about a real physical entity. We're not talking about an abstraction anymore. Now we're talking about a ball. These people are saying that, you know, this, uh, this phonon, uh, pho uh, I'm sorry, this chronon uh, is part of space-time. And because it's part of this uh, canvas, the fishnet, right, maybe where, where the fishnet, where the little strings of the fishnet cross, maybe those are the f uh, chronons, right? Because it's, it's a little ball that forms part of the fishnet, we're talking about a real object. You cannot later on wish it away and say, well, we were, you don't, you're not supposed to take it literally. You're not supposed to take the analogy literally. No, no, what they're describing is a physical object. They're saying, no, chronon is a ball. A ball this ball is part of space-time. It forms one second or maybe a millisecond, maybe a microsecond or a terasecond. You know, who knows what. But it forms a part of a physical object that prevents the Earth from flying out of the solar system. How am I supposed to interpret that as an abstraction? The Earth is for real. And so if something is holding it, in its orbit around the sun, what is it? What physical entity is it? And these people are saying it's space-time. What is space-time made out of? Made out of chronos. 